evening. How you guys doing? Good. Yeah. Everyone sounds really tired. Yeah, it's been a long week. I know. I know. If you guys have your Bibles, um, welcome to Catalyst. We're glad to have you guys here. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Malachi. <clears throat> so, you guys have your Bibles. Malachi, we're going to be looking at chapter 3. Okay, chapter 3. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 3. Okay, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to go ahead and read those out, and then we'll pray and begin. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It's also on the U version. Behold, I send my messenger... He will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father. I thank you for the beauty and the wonder of your word and the gospel. I pray tonight that you would give me the words um, that are true. Uh, I pray for clarity and humility, too, before these students, Lord, that I would come, um, also affected by the message, God, um, that we would wrestle together with the meaning of the text, um, that we would get a greater sense of your glory and who you are and the grace and mercy that is found in your son, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Well, <clears throat> so... There's been a reoccurring theme because we're going through one-hit wonders that I tend to like to bring up um, songs from the past, actual one-hit wonders um, that are relevant or speak to the situation that we're speaking about or talking about tonight. So the one I want to bring up tonight, it was the year 1975. Okay, do you know who the guy is? His name was Freddie Mercury, okay, lead singer of the band Queen, and he released his famous one-hit wonder, Bohemian Rhapsody, on October 31st. Not more than a month from where we're at right now. It actually hit number three on the greatest hit singles in the UK. Um, but if you listen to the song, it's a very perplexing, very strange song. Um, it has a ballad part to it, a rock part to it, and a mock opera is what they call it. Um, and it's one of the songs that most people don't really know what the meaning is. It's very strange. Elton John himself said, this song isn't going to be really popular. It's just too strange to play on the radio. Um, that's what he said concerning this song. But I, I want to go through it because I found some observations about it that I think are going to be very relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Um, I'm not claiming to know the exact meaning of the song. Even Freddie Mercury himself doesn't know. He doesn't even say what it meant. Um, so when you listen to it, if you ever have listened to it, it's kind of hard to make sense of what is going on in that song. But what catches me is that Freddie Mercury is, in a sense, singing about a mock trial. Okay. And I want to begin the song when he sings this, the lyrics, it's an intro, and he sings this. He says, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. I'm just a poor boy, I need no sympathy, because I'm easy come, easy go, little high, little low. Any way the wind blows doesn't really matter to me. Mama. Then he goes into this ballad, singing to his mom, right? He confesses, yes, mom. But he goes in and he talks about this act that he does, this murder that he commits. He sings this to his mom. He says, Mom, I just killed a man. I put a gun against his head, pulled my trigger, now he's dead. Mama, life had just begun, but now I've gone and thrown it all away. Didn't mean to make you cry, but I'm not back again this time tomorrow. Carry on, carry on, as if nothing really matters. Too late, my time has come. Send shivers down my spine, bodies aching all the time. Goodbye, everybody, I've got to go got to leave you all behind and face the truth. So he commits this horrible murder right in his song. Um, and he's evolving into this sense of he's got to face the reality, face the truth. Well, that's when the opera comes in, right? The mock opera, if you've listened to the song. And it sen descends down into basically where he's in purgatory or hell. And he's defending his life. He's trying to acquit himself of all the guilt that he feels. And it's this crazy, you know, back and forth. He's crying out to Galileo, crying out to Mamma Mia. Let me go. Let me go. Please let me go. And so this whole time, he's trying to get away out of his, his consequences, his sin. He sings, you know, I'm just a poor boy. Nobody loves me. He's just a poor boy from a poor family. Spare him his life from this monstrosity. So he, we have this one party that's vying for his life and this other that's telling him he's condemned. He must go to hell. Easy come, easy go. Will you let me go? And then you have the crazy Bismillah, no, we will not let you go. Let him go. Bismillah, we will not let you go. Let him go. 
Jasmilla, we will not let you go. Let him go. We'll not let you go. Never let you go. Never, never, never let me go. And I, when I was listening to that song and as I was thinking about it, he's crying out for salvation. He's crying out, can someone let me go? I'm just a poor boy. Nobody loves me. And then he goes into the hard rock. And I don't know who he's speaking to in this song, but it almost sounds like he's speaking to his supernatural oppressor, the one who's condemned him, the judge. In a sense, it sounds like he's speaking to God. He sings this when he goes into the hard rock. So you think you can stone me and spit in my eye. So you think you can love me and leave me to die. Oh, baby, can't do this to me. Just got to get out. Just got to get right out of here. In a sense, he's crying out. He says, fine, I'll admit it. You know, he, he, he looks to God and, or he looks to the person that says, so you think you can leave me? The blame is on you. And he rises up in this type of rebellious rock song. And in the end, he goes into blissful ignorance as he says, but nothing really matters. Anyone can see nothing really matters. Nothing really matters to me. In a sense, he's struggling with the truth and the reality of his guilt and his sin and what he's done. Just, just a secular song like this. I, I, I can hear the ache. I can hear that he understands. A lot of these people, John Lennon, Bob Dylan, they understand fundamentally that something's wrong with the human condition. They understand that there's this guilt inside of them, this sin inside of them, and they don't know what to do with it. And I think about the fact that he couldn't handle the truth. How many in this life, how many of us can't handle the truth of our guilt and judgment before God? How many of us can't face the reality that I'm wrong, that I'm wrong, the stark reality that we're far off, far worse off than we'd like to admit? You know, we prefer to see ourselves as the hero, not the villain, right? But according to the Bible, when we go through the word of God, especially the minor prophets, we realize that we're on the wrong end of this, that we're the ones that have sinned and done wrong. And just like Freddie Mercury, it's hard to handle the truth, and so sometimes we ignore it. We fly into ignorance, right? Nothing really matters. Or we blame God. We look at him and say, it's your fault. But I don't think I can accept the fact that I'm wrong in this situation. If you remember the, the uh, famous courtroom drama, A Few Good Men, and uh, Tom Cruise is questioning Jack Nicholson, if you ever watched it. Tom Cruise is like, you know, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth. You can't handle the reality of it. In the same sense, when we come against God's word, when it comes against the truth, sometimes we can't handle it. Sometimes we blame God. We, we go into ignorance. We plead ignorance. I don't know what you're talking about, God, when we confront our guilt and our shame. And that's basically what the book of Malachi is about, which is this one-hit wonder that was written many, 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 many years ago. And God comes to them and confronts them about their sins, about the way they've broken their covenant with God, but they plead ignorance. They say, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? Now, this is during the time, this is after the exile. So they've returned from exile. If you remember, Shani preached on the book of Haggai, right? And that was during the time, uh, during Ezra, Ezra, when they were rebuilding the temple, right? And they heard Haggai's words and they realized we need to put God first. We need to build the temple first. So they go, they build the temple. And then after this period, in between that and Nehemiah, most scholars believe, is when Malachi takes place. Except they don't admit, they don't confront, they don't recognize their guilt and sin before God. They simply plead ignorance the entire book. And this book is very much, as I, as I was reading it and studying it, is very much a tragedy in many sense because they fail to recognize. They don't want to confront the reality. They couldn't handle the truth that they were wrong. They were disillusioned, discontent, indifferent, and cynical. They did not take their relationship with God very seriously. So the book of Malachi, okay, structure-wise, is kind of like a courtroom drama. Okay, if you ever watched The Firm or The Client or Lincoln Lawyer, if you read John Grisham novels, um, and they're usually heats up into this climactic, you know, courtroom battle that's trying to, you know, prove the innocent guilt to you or try to get someone who is wrongfully, wrongfully accused, you know, acquitted of their guilt and to be able to be set free. That's kind of what the book of Malachi is like. So God has six claims. He comes to the people, the Jewish people, and he says, there are six claims, six disputes that I have with you. Okay? Claims. And then they respond with an objection. Okay? And then God provides the evidence, and they're overruled. Okay? That's pretty much what the structure of the entire book is. Six times. Six times they do this. So you can think of, like, the defendant, right? They say in those, like, southern court movies, is Israel. Okay? They're the ones put on the stand. And then you have the prosecutor, Malachi, representing God. And he's coming up and he's saying, here's the evidence against you. Here are the claims that you have wronged God or failed his law or failed his covenant. And each time they're like, objection, your honor. <laughs> What are you talking about? And then God provides the evidence, and it's overruled. 
and it comes to the realization that they were not right with God. So here's what I'm going to ask you guys before we, we dive into to the six disputes. Are you willing, are we willing to hear God's claims against us in the way that we've broken his law and covenant? Are we willing to see where we went wrong in our walk? When it comes to be confronted with our sin and spiritual rebellion, do we plead ignorance and make excuses, or do we plead Christ? Do we admit it and throw ourselves on the mercy and grace of Christ? That's the question as we go through this, okay? Courts in session, the first one was a denial of God's love. Denial of God's love. It says here in chapter 1, verse 2, God says, I have loved you. So notice when God comes, okay, what's his first dispute? What's his first claim? I have loved you. It's not even, it's not even that much of an accusation. It's just simply an assertion of who God is. And, and that just, I don't know about you, but that shows the character and faithfulness of God that he doesn't come here smacking upside the head. He simply comes and says, I have loved you. How different would it have been if they would have responded with an acknowledgement of that? But no, they deny it. That's the claim. They say, objection, your honor. How have you loved us? Verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? There was a denial, a sense of we, we, we're going to overlook the fact of God's faithfulness and goodness. And then God goes over. He says, but I chose you as a nation. I, I brought you out of Egypt from slavery. I, I, I brought you to the promised land. I, I helped overtake your enemies, and I, I tried to set you apart as a holy nation. I gave you my law, my commandments. I took care of you through the wilderness. I chose you. I didn't choose Esau. I chose Jacob, right? I love Jacob. Esau, I hated. I chose you as my people. Don't you see my love, my faithfulness, my goodness? Yet there's a denial of it. And what ways might we, let's apply this, okay? Denial of God's love. What ways might we be denying or rejecting God's love for us? In what ways are we ignoring the ways that God has loved and cared for us? And ultimately, we're going we're gonna to tie this to the gospel, and that's really where the, the supreme act uh, of God's love is shown in the sacrifice of his son, but how many of us deny it? How many of us don't really recognize it? Now, you may say, you know, what I, what I want to point out about this prophetic book is that the people aren't actually in a courtroom, okay? They're not actually talking back and forth. God is speaking the hearts of those people. He's saying this is what is in their hearts, meaning they're not just verbally saying it. They might not even notice that they're doing it, but nonetheless, their hearts display it. So you may not be visibly saying, Oh, God, how have you loved me? How have you been faithful? But maybe in our hearts, in our lack of gratitude, in our lack of praise, in our lack of recognition and going to God's word, we may be saying in a sense, but how have you loved me, God? Do we reject, do we deny God's love for us? And part of it is because we don't want to confront the fact that we haven't been loving him, right? When God brings us up, it's like, oh, you haven't been loving me. Oh, no, 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 don't, don't put the way on me, God. What about you? We do that with other people, right? Don't point out everything wrong with me because I don't want to look at me. I don't want to look at the problem. Number two, okay, and this, this one we're going to really kind of bank on because um, it's, 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 I think, a very important one. Number two, and they all start with D, so it's a little easy to memorize. Denial of God's love, number one. Number two, despising of God's name. There was a despising of God's name. It says here, chapter one, verse six, Six, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then, am I, am, if then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priest who despise my name. So he says, you have despised my name. You have, you have not brought me honor. You have not worshipped me rightly according to the covenant. And you are despising me. Objection, your honor. Objection. How have we despised your name? How have we polluted you? How have we profaned you? Now, I don't know if they're necessarily being sarcastic. Some commentators believe that they're actually being genuine, that they really are in ignorance. They really don't see what's wrong with the picture. They don't really see where God's talking about. And so they're asking him, in what ways have we not honored you? In what ways have we rejected you? Well, the evidence is pretty overwhelming, okay? God brings to it, he says, they were offering lame, sick, diseased, blind, and crippled animals for sacrifice. Okay, and, and I like how Francis Chan put it, they were serving leftovers. Okay, they were serving leftovers to God. Now, what was the point of the sacrificial system? Well, the reason that they had to bring a perfect male flock was to indicate that there needed to be a perfect sacrifice for their sins. Okay? God would not take anything less. Well, what does that point to? Is that foreshadow? Is that Jesus, who was the perfect sacrifice, right? 
So when they were offering blemished or crippled animals, they were basically saying my sin's not that serious because I don't need that perfect of a sacrifice. That's the symbolism there. And that's why it was so horrible. It wasn't that, you know, God necessarily wanted, you know, human sacrifice. It was to indicate the seriousness. It was more for the benefit of them recognizing than God recognizing. It was the benefit of them seeing this is how serious my sin is. And it cost it, right? Your, your good male flock, the one that was perfect, that's not the one you wanted to give away, right? That's not the one. That, that wasn't sacrificial enough. That wasn't, it, was, it was costly for them to give away the perfect male flock. Because what he was trying to say is, it hurts, guys. The, the sin that it causes, it's going to take a sacrifice, a huge one, to clear you of it. So they served God the leftovers in their worship. They were complaining and acting bored with worship. It says here in verse in verse uh, 13, but you say what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. The sense of like, ah, you know, I'm going to come up here and talk to you all about Malachi tonight. I hate it. Don't want to be here. Sorry. You guys make me tired. Really, you do. <laughs> but that's kind of the sense of what is happening here with God. Ugh. I really got to read my Bible today, 15 minutes. Do I really need to take time to pray? A half-hearted worship, a sense of not wanting to serve God, all of us, and be wholehearted. Half-hearted worship. They made false promises a good sacrifice. Oh, okay, God, I'll, I promise you I'll give you the male flock. He says this in, in verse uh, 13. Um, you bring what has been taken by violence or is lame and sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. So they also made false promises, right? Now I want to talk about these a little bit in application. What leftovers are you serving God? With your time, with your prayer, with your Bible meditation, with your thought life, discipleship, service? What are we, what are we not giving God fully up? Have we not recognized the great price that was paid? It's all of you you got to give. All of you, as Paul says. Our life is a spiritual sacrifice and offering. How many of us are complaining and acting bored with worship? Oh, you know, I, I, I don't want to love this person who's slandering me or being difficult. I don't want to love them. I'm tired of it. I'm weary of it. Discipleship, I don't want to disciple that other person. I, I, I'll just, whatever. I don't want to deal with it. Forgiveness? What a weariness this is. I, I don't care that Christ forgave me of all my sins. I'm not going to forgive this other person who wronged me. I'm not. I don't want to. You're tiresome, God. It's, you're, such, you're such a burden on me. You, you've carried my burdens to the cross, but you're burdening me. You're tiring me. Then we make false promises, right? Next time, I'll, I won't look at porn. Next time, I'll... I'll disciple that person next semester. You know, I, I know, God, you're, you're teaching me to lead a small group and actually take initiative and service projects. We'll wait till next semester when I'm not so busy. I'll give you the leftovers. That's about all I can give you. But my life's more important right here, right now. Not only that, but they strayed from God's law. They made people stumble and sin because of it. Ah, you know, it's okay. Let's just, you know, let's watch a little bit of the show that's going to, you know, stumble my brother next to me. He struggles with porn. It's okay. Hey, come out. Let's just have a few drinks, just a little bit more. Stay up. Forget the test. Let me just push the boundaries just a little bit more with my girlfriend or boyfriend. Just a little bit. Let me, we, st we make people stumble because we forget God's law. Because this is such a weariness, we close it, we put it on the bookshelf, we say, I'm done. <laughs> Ultimately, they forgot. The question is, what is your worship like? What is your devotion to God? What is my devotion to God? And notice he's specifically talking yeah, I'm going to make some of you uncomfortable to the leaders, too, the priests, the Levites, okay, spiritual leaders, officer team, house guys, room leaders, those of you in leadership positions in your church or in some type of ministry role, you set the tone, okay? You set the tone. I set the tone. I have been so convicted lately to be like, how much I read God's word and teach about God's word from his word, right, is going to dictate maybe the tone for all of you guys. As a staff, that's something we think about. That's something we have to consider. But he calls out the leaders because that's where it started from. Okay? 
Now, this principle applies to everybody. I'm not, he's not just talking about the leaders, okay? We can talk about this in the application for everyone. But here's the one thing I recognize, and this is something that a commentator really made a point of. They had lost the awe and wonder of God. They had lost it. That's why it was such a weariness, because they had forgotten what Christ had done for them. Your attitude of weariness or demeanor really dictates how much you've really lacked seeing who Christ is for you. I, I think about me and Lake had talked um, last semester this really always sticks in my mind. I probably said it before. Sorry, got to hear it again. Um, but we were talking about how when you go to God's word, you're really going to see the glory of Christ. Okay? It's like when you go to the Grand Canyon. This is what kind of Lake made a mention of. I can't take credit. I'm not, I'm not that brilliant. But when you go to the Grand Canyon, right, you look and behold it. You see it. You're in awe of it, right? But when you leave, right, the next week, it's still kind of vivid. The, Im- the image is vivid. You can remember the canyons, the, the color the taste, the smell, right? You can remember that picture vividly. But, you know, that's a, thou- you know, a couple thousand miles away, right? So you're here in Missouri, so you only have the picture in your mind of it, right? And then in another two weeks, you know, the lines of the canyon kind of start blurring. The color isn't as vivid. The taste and smells is kind of fading away. And, you know, the next six months, you don't have that picture anymore, and you've lost your awe and wonder it, of it, right? Grand Canyon's about, I don't know, a couple thousand miles away. The Bible is literally inches from my face, and inches from your face. And so when we lose sight of the awe and beauty of God, we need to go back to it, right? We, you know, we see a wall, we don't see a window. It's a window into the majesty and beauty and glory of Christ. And when we lose our awe, then we become numb to it, we become dull to it. <coughs> become, in a sense, we just disregard it. The third, I know, Trying to move quickly. Number the third is disloyalty toward God and others. Okay, disloyalty towards God and others. When we look at chapter two, verse ten, he accuses them and says, "Look, guys, <clears throat> the claim is that you have been unfaithful to God by marrying foreign wives." Okay, and it wasn't that God had anything against different ethnicities. He was basically just saying these foreign wives, though, they were drawing you into idolatry. They were drawing you into worship of foreign gods, not me. Furthermore, they were unfaithful to their own wives. Okay, so unfaithfulness to God, unfaithfulness to their own wives, and they were basically disloyal towards God. But their objection is why, you know, one of the things that they were asking God is, why don't you bless us? Why aren't you, you know, accepting our sacrifice? Why not? That was their objection, and God's like, can't you see your unfaithfulness? Can't you see? The problem's not me, guys. The problem is, is that you don't want to follow my life. You don't want to follow after me. Overruled, you, you've abandoned your wives. You've blamed God. You've married foreign wives and adopted their idolatry. In what ways are we being unfaithful or, or, or disloyal to God and others? Do we have a mercenary attitude? Well, I'll serve God only so much as it benefits my other motives. That's unfaithfulness, right? That's the general principle. Number four, they were disregarding God. It says in chapter 2, verse 17, You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, How have we wearied him? By saying, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, Where is the God of justice? So God says, Guys, you have... Do you hear God's plead here? You have wearied me with your words. You're, you're, making, you're, you're, in a sense, breaking my heart for what you're saying because you don't recognize where you've gone wrong. Objection. How have we wearied you, God? In fact, everyone who does evil is good in your sight, right? And he delights in them. Where is the God of justice? In other words, they were saying, God, I don't see you enacting your justice, so I'm just going to do what I want. They were disregarding him. God brings the evidence that the day of the Lord is coming. He speaks of a time when, you know, we, we and I don't want to hit on it too much again because we've, we've talked about a lot, the, the day of the Lord that's coming. It's going to judge the righteous, right, as, as saved, and they're going to look at the wicked and destroy the wicked and judge them, right? There's going to be a difference. There's going to be a separation of the two, right? And he says, you think you're ready, but you're not ready. You're not ready. He's pleading with them, consider these things. What's interesting, though, is that Pretty much what they're saying in this part of the scripture is that, hey, it seems like, God, you bless the wicked just along the righteous. So if that's the case, then I'm just going to do whatever I want. If, if, if we're both going to walk out of here okay with blessings and my circumstances are going to change, if I'm not going to lose my job, if I'm not going to lose money, if I'm going to still have a good reputation, then I'm just going to keep doing what I do. I'm going to keep sinning. But that shows the heart of somebody who isn't really 
captured by the awe of God, right? The wonder of God. When God is slow to wrath and judgment, it is really a litmus test of where our loyalty lies. In other words, do we abstain from evil because we want good blessings? Or do we abstain from evil because we love God? We love who he is. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. If there's no consequences immediately, I'll just do what I want. But what he reminds them in chapter 3 in the passage we just read in the beginning of the sermon is that the day of the Lord is coming, okay? There will be judgment. When you plead yourself before Christ, before God, there will be a time when you will have to answer for everything. The day of the Lord, it's coming, right? As in Habakkuk, Habakkuk struggled with it, the justice of God is coming. What we were reminded of, it's coming. And once again, Malachi is saying, guys, don't, don't miss this one. In what ways are we missing it, right? Number five, there was disingenuous repentance before God. Disingenuous repentance before God. <clears throat> The Lord says this, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, in verse 6, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes, and I have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Usually, when you're in a court, right, the, the prosecutor doesn't want the guy, you know, to get anything out of the, he wants to get the worst sentence usually, right? But here God is, not only as the prosecutor here, but he's pleading, you can return to me. But he, what's the problem? All these thousands of years of history, they've continued to reject him. And God has said, return to me. Return to me. God is a God of second chances. Come to me. We've gone through all the minor prophets. Second chance after second chance after second chance after second chance. He's pleading with them, okay? This isn't more of an accusation. What it turns out is God is pleading to us, please turn from your sin. You can still return to me. And what's their response? Objection. How? How will we return to you? And, and by the way, how are we robbing you. How are we robbing you of your glory? They lack the motivation to repent. And they just didn't want to believe the problem. What was wrong was that they wanted a clear conscience, but not a clean conscience. What do I mean by that? Meaning, they just wanted the feeling of guilt gone. It was a worldly struggle. Just, I want to feel better about myself. I just want a clear conscience, but I don't want to be actually clean. I don't want to actually be acquitted of guilt. I don't want to actually deal with it seriously. I just want the feeling to go away. So we dole our conscience, right? When it comes to repentance, we just try to do away with those feelings. You know, kind of like Freddie Mercury. Ah, you know, I, I, it's just, I can't handle this, this terror in my soul. So you know what? Nothing really matters. I don't care about what's right or wrong. I don't care about what's true or false. As long as I don't feel this pain, as long as I'm not convicted or confronted with my sin, let me just go into blissful ignorance. Let me just go into oblivion because I can't handle the truth. I can't deal with it. And in the same way, we dull our conscience over and over again when we don't seriously repent, when we don't, we don't want a clean conscience. We just want to be clear. We just, want to, we just want to feel better about ourselves, but we don't want the problem to be actually be dealt with. Oh, I, I have struggled with this one a lot. Just because you feel good about yourself doesn't mean you're right with God, okay? Just because you feel good about yourself doesn't mean you're right with God. And in a society that says, feel good about yourself, you know, you're number one. Be who you are, do what you feel, but yet all the while they're taking them down the wide road of destruction. Because some of us can't handle the truth, right? It's too much. I know that this is a, t a tough sermon and... Um, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say it, it is. It isn't tough. It is, it's a hard one. I'm getting a hard time going through this one. But number six, and and there is good news at the end. Okay, just want to want to disclose that. Number six, there's just disbelief about our guilt and sin. Just a general disbelief. After this huge court battle between God and the Jews, right? He says, "Your words have been hard against me." I'm pleading with you. You've been, you've been very hard against me. It sounds like a God that's kind of brokenhearted. I don't know. Someone who's really saddened. You know, courtroom battles aren't a pretty thing, right? It breaks his heart to see that his people have rejected him. It breaks his heart when you see you guys reject him constantly. It breaks his heart when I ignore him. 
when I serve him leftovers, when I disregard him, when I don't have true repentance. And then they say this, how have we spoken against you? What's their response? They can't handle the truth. They can't stand the fact that they're wrong, that they're the sinner, that they're the one who broke the covenant. Because we don't like to be the villain of the story, right? Whenever we watch, you know, the Avengers or Marvel movies, we like to think of ourselves as, you know, Captain America or Thor. But in reality, we're, we're the villain when it comes to the story of the Bible, guys. Now, this is hard news, okay? This is a reason why the, the, the road is narrow. Because our pride does not allow us to go to that extent. I, I, I am in such disbelief that I could be that bad. I can't believe it. That's what they were saying. God, I, I can't believe that, that you must, surely must be the one wrong. I think you're the blame here. But how can we welcome grace in our lives unless we admit our guilt? How can you plead for mercy if you don't for, first recognize your need for mercy? You see, all of this is just to show us and bring us to a point where recognizing I am guilty before God. I am guilty. But when we recognize our need for guilt, that is when we can recognize the beauty of grace and mercy in Christ. How are you going to conquer porn unless you first admit you've sinned by immersing yourself in it? How are you going to be given the mercy and grace to overcome slander, hate, and anger unless you first admit you have a problem with slander, anger, and hate? How are you going to stop being bitter and angry with others unless you first admit that you are struggling with bitterness and anger? How are you going to be made right with God unless you understand that you need to be right with God? Because you're not going to think you need a savior unless you know you need saving. That's pretty much the point. That's what he was saying. He's like, guys, but the key, and here's the key, and this is the settlement, okay? This is where we're going to end on. Usually in a court, you know you have a settlement, you know, case, you know, Session's now closed. There's a settlement of some sort that has to be made. I think God answers this question in two passages in Malachi. In chapter 3, it's the one we just read. For sake of time, I'm not going to go through it again, but he talks about a person who's to come who will fulfill the covenant. He will, he will be righteous, right? And not only will he justify the sinner, not only will he justify the guilty before God, acquitting them of their guilt, but he will sanctify them so that they may live out a covenant, that they may live out the law of God. It, as Jeremiah 31 says, I will write your, my law on your heart. So grace is not simply just a part, and I like what John Piper says. He says, grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned. Grace is the enabling gift and power of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. So we're justified, right? In Christ, because of his perfect sacrifice, he lived a life of righteousness, proven in the wilderness, right? Tempted many times more than any human being could have ever gone that far and succeeded in every way that we have failed. But you can't benefit from his sacrifice unless we plead guilty and plead Christ. But it's not, it's not just pardon, it's power. It sanctifies us, it renews us. So how might we benefit from the grace and righteousness of Christ before God if you plead innocence? Now hear me out, it's very important. If you plead innocence, that is the path to destruction because you're saying, I do not need grace. I do not need a savior. It's the sense of pride in us. And the minor prophets have been a very hard study because guess what? It's, a, it, it's smashing my pride. I, I, you know, I hope it's smashing yours and showing we can't fulfill the covenant. That's the reason why the Old Testament's so huge <laughs> compared to the New Testament. Over and over again, they couldn't keep it. They kept failing. They weren't the hero. They were the villain. They were the problem, not the solution. So the day of the Lord is much a day of judgment. And I know, you know, I, I was kind of questioning if I should use this analogy, but, you know, it is like a courtroom, okay? And then we go up to there, and the, guilt, the, the judge is going to ask you, God's going to ask you, do you plead innocence or do you plead guilty? Right? They ask that every time, right? And if we plead guilty, we, plead, we want to plead Christ. It is on Christ's righteousness that I stand. It is on him that I throw myself. It is his grace I'm caught by the awe and wonder of what he has done for me. I pray to God that the Holy Spirit would show you guys the awe and wonder of God's love through Christ Jesus so that on the day of judgment, that all of you, that all of you would plead guilty and plead Christ.
That's my prayer. That's my hope. The sad reality is some of you are going to plead innocence, though. The statistics, okay? Many of you will plead because narrow is the path to life. Wide is the path to destruction. When you plead Christ, though, the devil is going to come up and he's going to be like, objection, objection. You, you disbelieved God. You were disingenuous in your repentance. You disregarded him. You, you, were, you were disregarding him. You were sinning against him. You, have, you, you don't have anything to stand on. And God's going to say, well, Christ took on the, he took on the sacrifice. He took on the punishment. Overruled, okay? Overruled. The evidence of Christ's crucifixion, resurrection, has saved those who plead guilty and plead Christ before God. That is the path to salvation. That is the gospel I can tell you in a nutshell. Now, you got you to gotta take the bad news before you get to the good news, right? Went over six claims, six disputes. In what ways have you broken God's covenant? In what ways can you look at yourself and say, I'm guilty? I have wronged God. I have wronged others. Before God alone, I can't stand before him. Well, good news. Christ has taken your place. You can be justified by his sacrifice and sanctified. No other religion. If you've got a religion, you come and stand up and you tell me right now, do you know any religion where the God has stepped down off his throne to sacrifice his life for you and to make you new? Every religion's all about new rules. Let's get a new rule book. Let's get a new thing to, to see how we can save ourselves. But no, it says you can't save yourself. Admit it. Come to Christ. You may be saved. And the good news is that after this part of looking at the minor prophets, we're going to go to the, the epistles and we're going to see the glory of Christ's power and grace worked out in the church. Is it working out here today? Are you living it out? In what ways? You may be a long-standing follower of Christ who has to admit some sins and guilt. But maybe some of you today have never, ever thought about your standing before God. I do want to say this, um, and usually the worship team talks about this. In the back, they usually pray up there where Derek's at. Hey, hey, Derek. If you guys need to pray or talk about these things, as a staff, especially in officers, nothing would please me more to walk through this with you. I, I don't expect, you know, 30 minutes just to be, you know, life-changing all the time. But if you're seeking answers, if you're trying to understand these things, let me talk to you. That's, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what Nathaniel wants to do, and, and Kyla, and Shandy, and Mariah, and the officers, too. Let's walk you through this. But this is about your eternal life. This is about your standing before God. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. I'll be up there in the back too with Derek, but if you guys want to pray, if you guys want to consider how are you going to plead, in a sense you're going to plead guilty and you're going to plead Christ, let's talk about it with you. Let's pray about it. Maybe some of you today have already decided, I'm going to plead Christ. That on the day of judgment, I'm going to say, I have, I have sinned, I have failed, I've been guilty, but it's in Christ that I find my righteousness and find my worth and find my identity. I plead him. So if you guys want to pray at the end of this, we'll have some of us up there to pray. If you want to talk about it later after on, come to us as a staff. We would, we would love to do that. But with that, let's, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I know it's really tough news, tough things to understand and work through. I pray, God, that you would help us to think through these things. That, um, Lord, that we, you would help us to confront our guilt and sin, knowing that there's good news, Lord, that in you we've been saved, that we can have a, a, a Savior who's died for us, who sacrificed his life for us. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would unveil people's eyes to see this glory and awe and wonder. And Lord, if we have lost it along the path and journey um, to glory, Lord, that you would remind us of it. Looking into your word, by encouragement of one another in the community. Um, that you provided for us. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.